Hey everybody, this is The Fourth here, and welcome to Sound Explained, Amplitude, and the Digital Decibel. So I want to start off by saying that the information provided in this video contains a number of mathematical functions. And if you aren't very good at math, don't worry, and just pay attention to kind of the basics of what I'm saying here. I should be explaining things so that the concepts are understandable without the math. So let's get started. Sound exists as waveforms, both in the real world and inside your digital audio workstation. How these waveforms work and are represented inside your workstation will be the foundation of all of the Sound Explained videos. So let's take a closer look. Here is a waveform representation of a drum sample. You can see the waveform is displayed on a graph, where the x-axis plots time, and the y-axis plots amplitude. You will notice that as the drum sample fades out, its amplitude values approach the center line, which represents an amplitude of zero. Because the center line is zero, you have both positive and negative amplitude values. The majority of waveforms for sounds that you use while producing will fluctuate between these positive and negative amplitude values. Larger fluctuations will produce louder sounds than smaller fluctuations. The maximum and minimum amplitude values allowed before clipping on many audio file formats are represented as positive one and negative one in the digital audio workstation. Any sound information that exceeds these values will be lost by clipping off. There will be more information about clipping in a later Sound Explained video. Outside of this waveform view, when we use amplitude in digital audio, we are often referring to peak amplitude. Peak amplitude is equal to the absolute value of your waveform's amplitude, and therefore will always be a positive value. So you can see this waveform here has entirely negative values for its amplitude. But if you look over here on the peak amplitude meter, you'll see that it still displays a positive value for peak amplitude. And the value it's displaying is the absolute value of this amplitude. For a single cycle waveform, the peak amplitude would be measured as the maximum absolute value that occurs during a single cycle. So for this sine waveform, it would be measured as the highest amplitude here, which is about 0.39. If you look up here, it will say the amplitude value I'm hovering over, and it's about 0.39. And if I play that, you'll see it shows as about 0.39 as well. 0 0.25, 0 0.3, 0 0.35, 0 0.4. It's right below 0.4. Now, if you look over at this waveform, you'll see that the negative amplitude is the same as the sine waveform over here, but the positive amplitude isn't peaking as high. So in this case, the maximum absolute value of the amplitude will occur in the negative amplitude values of this waveform, which is, if you look back up at the tips bar, about negative 0.39 again. But when you take the absolute value of that, it goes to just 0.39. And when I play this, you should see that on the peak amplitude meter over there. So you'll see that that is correct. And the reason this is the case is because these fluctuations in amplitude happen so quickly that it's not practical to record or display them as they fluctuate. And we don't really hear them that way either. We hear them as a solid sound with no fluctuations. But you'll see, if I play a sound with a low enough frequency, like 1 hertz, you'll actually be able to see the fluctuation on both the decibel meter and the peak amplitude meter. And I can slow it down even more so you can see it better. But as I increase that, you'll see that it holds a steady value instead. 
So peak amplitude seems pretty straightforward. Scaling from zero, which would be silence, to one, which is the maximum level allowed before clipping. So why don't we use a simple linear scale to measure it, rather than the weird decibel unit where the maximum level is at zero and the minimum is at negative infinity? Well, let's take a look at that. So right now I'm going to compare a few values on the decibel meter to those on the peak amplitude meter. So let's start off by looking at changes between negative six decibels and zero decibels. These changes don't sound very drastic. Like, they are considerable, but they don't sound drastic. Especially when you compare them to everything below negative six decibels. So if you're in a quiet room, or you have headphones, or your speakers are turned up pretty well, you should be able to hear this. And as I increase it to negative six decibels, it sounds like a huge gain in volume. especially compared to if I now increase it from negative six to zero. So that difference doesn't sound very big at all compared to the previous difference I showed you. But if you watch the peak amplitude meter, I'll show it to you again. So here's below negative six decibels. And that's negative six decibels, and you can see I'm only at about half of the amplitude. So that huge change in volume actually only goes up to half of the peak amplitude. And what was seemingly a much smaller change in volume is actually the other half of your available amplitude. So you can see that the decibel scale kind of aligns better with how we actually hear sound. And this is something you could learn a lot more in depth uh, by searching online. I'm just touching on it briefly in this video. So you can see it's much more convenient to work with the decibel because of how we perceive loudness, even if the scale is a bit weird at first. So how exactly are amplitude values expressed using the decibel? Well, let's start by looking at the equation for generating digital decibel values. So this equation is 20 log base 10 of your measured amplitude divided by a reference amplitude. As you can see from this equation, the decibel does not provide an absolute measurement, but rather expresses a ratio between two values, your measured amplitude and a reference amplitude. If we look back to the peak amplitude of our waveform, we will find that two values really make sense for use as proper reference points. And these values are zero, which would be silence, or the maximum possible amplitude before clipping, which as mentioned before is represented as one. And we can't use zero because it would result in the equation 20 log base 10 of your measured amplitude divided by zero. And if you know math, you know that we can't really get proper values if we're dividing by zero. So now it only makes sense to use the maximum possible amplitude before clipping, which is one. So let's take a look at a few measured amplitude values sent through this equation with one as the reference. So the equation simplifies to 20 log base 10 of your measured amplitude. So if we graph this function, we can see that a measured amplitude of zero or silence will be negative infinity decibels. And a measured amplitude of one, or the maximum amplitude value before clipping, will be zero decibels. 0.5, or half of the available amplitude before clipping, is about negative six. So this is why the decibel scale exists how it does in the digital domain, and why we work with only negative decibel values while mixing. This is also why you can fit so much information into the highest decibel range, and that's because zero to minus six decibels contains half of your available amplitude. And that's something I was always kind of surprised about when I was first getting into producing. You know, it always seemed like I was getting closer and closer to clipping, but I never was clipping. 
And that was before I knew all this and before I knew that, you know, minus six decibels is actually only half of the available amplitude before clipping. Now, I do want to mention that for the sake of simplicity, I haven't really mentioned 32-bit floating point audio. And 32-bit floating point audio can actually surpass an amplitude of 1 or 0 decibels by quite a bit. However, for the purpose of mixing, 0 decibels or an amplitude of 1 should still be considered your maximum before clipping, because that is the case for the majority of digital audio file formats. So this information in this video isn't essential for getting a good mix, but I believe knowing certain technical aspects of digital audio can help to demystify parts of the mixing process, which is why I have included these Sound Explained videos with this mixing tutorial.